course. Maybe not. Oh, here we go. Really, there's not tons left about tables. There really isn't tons concerning tables. Um, I do want to talk about some additional styling things that you can do, and I want to talk about some accessibility issues, and then a couple sort of advanced things. But one thing about tables is you're generally best off avoiding advanced things. Like, for example, you can merge columns or rows like you can in Excel. But a lot of times if you do that, that sort of just complicates the table. The other thing to avoid is avoid com uh, combining data in the tables. For example, if our temperature table that we're going to look at in a minute, if we had a second temperature a uh, piece of information that related to the amount of snowfall or something like that. Try not to combine it into one table. Make two separate simple tables instead of one complex table. Again, this sort of goes along the lines of universal design. That's good for accessibility reasons, but it's good for everyone else as well. Um, so let's take a look at that. Sure. If when you say combined, if we were to add another column or add another country or I mean another row, obviously that's not a problem. But if we were to add one more column to give additional data, no. that would be a different situation. Yeah, that's a different situation. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of show you what I mean in a minute here. Um, the situation I'm talking about is where you really have two tables, but for whatever reason, you think it's it's cooler to combine it with uh, data that's already here. Um, even Canvas is tired from a long semester and looking forward to a short week. I can tell. So, in this case, if we had something like this, here we have a temperature table. Where we have this. Um, let's say, for example, if we wanted to show... Um, rainfall also in this table. Um, you might think, well, let's do it like this. Let's just take and combine to this table like this. think of doing something clever like this where you take and you combine in one table the average temperature and the average rain uh, rainfall where the first so many rows is the average temperature and the second is the average rainfall that's what I mean about like having two tables in one that's really two tables now a better approach would be if you want to do this is make it columns and nests where you could have if you wanted to show rainfall inches and rainfall centimeters, you could just make it a column in that, and that would be okay. Or if you wanted this sort of approach, uh, then make it a new table. 
then you know then just make it a, a, a table on its own so don't combine things that way all right some of the other things that we can do um, there is a scope attribute and a scope attribute is used for accessibility and there are a couple ways uh, to do it um, Let's look at what I'm going to do. There's a couple ways to accomplish accessibility on forms, but the scope is sort of a straightforward one. There's also a headers tag that you can use. It's sort of like the label tag, where you associate the text of a table cell with the data in another table cell. But I can say, for example, scope equals column. And what that means, this doesn't make a visible change, but this associates, this tells the assistive technology, the screen readers, that hey, this, these headers go all the way down the column. So again, it doesn't do anything visible, but the screen reader then knows that state is the header for this column average Fahrenheit for this, average centigrade for this, and rank. The other thing which I think is deprecated, and deprecated doesn't mean 100% that you can't use it, but it's sort of there may be another way to do it um, that's coming into play, is where you could have a scope for a row. And you can say Alabama, the state name, sort of is like a heading for the whole row. Actually, if we do that, I think we can't, I don't think we're supposed to put a, a scope on a TH so we can make, a TD so we can make it a TH. Because this is sort of a, a row header. So I'll make these THs instead. And again, this really won't have too much of an impact on the table. Now that it's a TH, it is uh, underlined. We could get rid of that if we wanted to. And I left a couple of pieces of data at the end. No. There we go. Notice when doing that, we underline that column and we don't want that. How do we get rid of that? Again, remember, whenever you have a situation where you want to style certain things one way and certain things not that way, you can do it with a class or an ID. And in this case, I would say probably a class would be better. So I'm going to put a class on this row. something like top header. Then I'll change my style rule to say instead of saying all THs, I'll say everything in the top header. TH. And in that way, we won't get those. We only get the one underlined. So the scope, we either say column or row. We essentially say, well, this piece of data sort of identifies either the column or the row of data. Average temperature centigrade, that tells you what this column represents. Alabama, that tells you what this row is. And if my memory serves right, uh, you shouldn't put it on a TD, so put it on a TH, because you're saying it's a header, so it should be in a, on a TH tag. There are a couple of tags that come in handy sometimes for accessibility and for other reasons, and that is the T head, the T body, 
and the T foot. And those go around the rows that are in the header, the body of the table, and finally the footer. For example, maybe at the very bottom of the table we want an average for the whole table. Depending on the kind of data it is, it could be an average, or it could be a sum, or it could be a minimum and maximum, but it's sort of like totals, if we have totals on a table of any form. We can put those in a T foot tag. This helps again for accessibility because the assistive technology can find the T foot and understand right off the bat that okay this is the footer. It's also good for styling reasons. Remember, every tag every tag that you put on your HTML page gives you another opportunity for something to style on. Right? So, for example, I have this average in here. And I don't like the way that it blends in with the rest of the table. Right? Uh, at a glance, it looks like this could just be a state called average, right? So I can style it a little bit differently to set it off. So for example, I could say T foot border top two pixels black solid. And that sets it off. What ending mark? I must have. I don't know. I didn't do anything special. Well, I did a keystroke. I keystroked <laughs> the, the curly bracket. All right. Um, so that's that, all right? Um, let me see what else. You can combine columns and rows by saying call span and row span. Um, for example, it does, this example doesn't really lend itself to that. But if Alabama... Let's say their average temperature is negative 40 centigrade, which is also negative 40 Fahrenheit. I could do this and say call span equals 2. And I'll go across two spans, uh, span two columns. So that number covers both of them. I usually avoid doing that. If it really was the same value for both, I would just type it in twice, put it in twice. There is a neat thing that you can do with tables, especially if they were long tables and especially if they were, they were wide, where they went all the way across the screen. Uh, that would be to style alternate uh, lines a different color. Uh, you might have all have seen, or some of you might have seen, uh, the old computer paper, which are called green bar paper, where it had alternating lines of like a light green on the paper. And all that really does is it helps your eye align things going across. All right? Because you have a tendency, especially if the, there's a lot of data in the table, a lot of rows, a lot of columns, if I'm reading going across, your eye sort of has a natural tendency maybe to drift up or down a little bit. And you're liable to uh, get confused and, and show uh, and, and associate the wrong piece of data with the wrong row or column, uh, especially row. What you can do, though, is you can style alternate colors 
differently in a table. So I got to remember how to do that. Here's a good example of this. We can see easily going across. We know that number is January, not February, because the colors alternate. And this is a code to do it. Nth child even, nth child odd. So I could go in to the style sheet here and say everything inside the T box. Make the nth, make the even children have that color, and make the odd child have that color. And I pasted way too much stuff in here. Again, notice how the selectors are getting more and more advanced. I would imagine this will come in handy for your project when you're styling things. Because the first few classes where we start experimenting with CSS, we do it in a very, uh, we, we paint with a broad brush. In other words, if we make a paragraph a certain color, we make every paragraph that color. Whereas notice how we can refine with our selectors. Remember, the selector is the first part. It says what gets the style rule. So in this case, I'm doing some of the style rules just as I did before with the HTML tag. In other cases, I can use a class or a combination of a class and the HTML tag. And finally, I use this, which is called a pseudo class, to pick up the even and odd things. You can also use ID. Um, generally speaking, most of your style rules will be based off of class, the HTML tags, or some combination. The idea is when you literally have one thing on the page and you know there's only ever going to be one thing on a page like that, you can give it an ID. So this will make this table look like this. So it alternates the colors for that. And it just does that within the TD section, or the, within the table body section, which is nice. It leaves the header and footer section alone, so if I want to do some different styling with that, I can. So maybe T head, I can make background pound CCC color equal color of black, for example. Or color of white, let's say. Let's make it a little darker just so it shows differently than the other rows. And maybe to put the average stand out. Well, we already have the average standing out by having a, uh, a border above it. I'm not really sure if there's anything else with tables. Um, <coughs> in the old days when we used tables for layout, it was a mess. All right? We would put tables inside of tables, which, again, is one of those things that you can do, but it's suggested that you don't simply because... Uh, of the complexity of it makes things uh, inaccessible and makes very difficult to maintain. An example of how you could do that is you could put a table, you know, if you had a table for each professor, you might have a cell for their email address and a cell for their office. Then you could have a whole table that showed their schedule as a cell within that table. Just because you can do it doesn't mean it's a good idea to. You're better off keeping your tables simple. All right. One thing I don't think I have shown you, and uh, a, a student alluded to this, uh, but uh, running things through a validator. All right. There are a couple of validators available that essentially are like 
a word spell check or grammar check. All right? HTML is a language that has rules, and we've covered the important rules, but we haven't literally covered every rule. Right? Just like in English class, you might not talk about splitting infinitives or whatever. All right? But we've talked about the main rules. But there's a whole bunch of rules. And the first step to having a web page that is cross-browser compatible or cross-device compatible is to make sure that you follow the rules. Because when you, when you break the rules, that's where your page can break down. That's the easiest place where your page can break down. Now, that doesn't guarantee that you, just because you follow the rules, that your page will be displayed correctly on all platforms. But it's a good place to start. So the organization that actually publishes these web standards, w3c.org, not to be confused with the W3 school site that I use, but they're the people that determine what the new languages are and what are the enhancements in existing languages. And they provide, somewhere on here, validators. And you can validate several different things. This is validating your HTML code. All right? I'm going to validate by direct input, which means I'm going to go and I'm going to paste my code right there. So let me go in here and paste my HTML code in here. And it will tell me if I have any errors in here. I check it, and I have a couple errors. I have a stray doc type. Oh, well, that doesn't sound good. Actually, I think I pasted it in twice, maybe. Yeah, I did. All right, I don't have any errors in here. I have a warning. And the warning is uh, something you probably should take care of, but it's not a tragedy if you don't. Um, if you don't include a language, for example, on this, um, it will assume English, it will assume a default language. Uh, and I can do that simply by putting in the language and it will tell me here sort of what to do. and it shows you why to do it. One thing I will say about this is these are the specifications for the language. It's like they're a contract and they're written in very precise technical language which means that the W3C site is not always the best site to learn how to do something. Um, It would be like trying to figure out where to make your house payments by reading your contract that you bought your house with, right? There's probably other places to get that information that will be much more succinct and so on. But in this case, all I really have to do is say lang equals en and I'm clean. No errors or warnings. So that's good. Does that mean my page will be cross-browser compatible? Of course not. All right? All this is saying is that my page, and it certainly doesn't mean that my page is a good web page. Right? You can write utter nonsense in your term paper for whatever class, and Word won't flag anything um, because all Word is doing is checking the syntax and making sure you don't have any spelling or grammar errors. Same thing here, right? In your zoology paper, you could write that an elephant is a rare flying mammal and, you know, other nonsense like that, right? 
just like your web page can be poorly designed, it can have wrong information, it can be very difficult to read, not very usable, but if you follow the rules of the tags, it'll come out without any errors or warnings. Let's look at some of the errors that you might get. One of them is if you put in a bad tag name. So for example, I misspelled the word table there. This actually generates a bunch of errors. I got 72 errors from putting that in. Why is it? Well, because when I didn't spell the word table right, it notices a bunch of problems. All right? It knows, for example, that this tag doesn't make sense and shouldn't be in the body. It knows that there shouldn't be a caption unless it's inside a table. And this isn't a table. This is a misspelled table. So captions belong in tables. Therefore, it doesn't know what to make of the start tag. It doesn't know what to make of the end tag either. It doesn't know what T head is unless it's in a table. Again, since I misspelled tables. So all my other errors are related to the fact that I misspelled the word table here. So don't be alarmed if you get like a lot of errors the first few times that you run your code through this. Because every error doesn't translate to a mistake you made, all right, uh, in a one-to-one -one way. There's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the error messages you've seen and mistakes that you made. One error, one mistake that you made could generate a whole bunch of errors. In this case, one error generated 72, one mistake I made generated 72 errors. And if you fix it, oh, okay, I spelled it wrong, then all 72 of them magically disappear. <coughs> the other thing to keep in mind is it doesn't report the errors in a way that is easily understandable. All right? Remember, this is a computer program checking your code. And it's repeating, it's following a very technically written specification. So therefore, the errors it gives you are, are presented in a very sort of precise technical language that isn't necessarily understandable. Like, it would be nice if I misspelled table if it said, gee, you probably mean that's supposed to be a table tag. Right? But it doesn't. It just freaks out on you and gives you 72 errors. So it takes a little bit of a challenge to interpret these things. In this case, you'll say element tabe not allowed as a child. Element tabe? Oh, I must have misspelled table. And then you can correct it. You can, uh, what other kinds of errors besides illegal tags? If you have tags in the wrong place, for example, let me try to put the title down here. That shows up in an error because you're supposed to have a title in your head tag and not in your body tag. This, in, 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 in this particular instance, this upset the validator so much that it just quit on you. It said, I've had enough of your nonsense. I'm out of here. So that last error says, cannot recover from last error and is going to ignore any errors. In other words, you confuse the code so much that it can't even continue. So tags in the wrong place. I didn't spend a lot of time talking about this, but I implied a lot. But one of the things is, is that a title should be in a head tag. And what's more, you have to have a title in your head tag. If you don't, you'll get an error on that. Oops. Wrong place again. Oh, 
I must have accidentally gotten rid of the end table tag too. So that's another case of an error that will give you if you have a starting tag and you don't have the ending tag. So the best way to learn this is to actually do it. So go back and validate some old pages that you've done. See what errors you get. See if you can understand the errors and more importantly see if you can correct them. All right. The same thing exists for CSS. leave this off correctly so yeah you're right I need to go a little further down oh I cut off a whole bunch of this let me recopy the whole thing in the other thing to, is important to remember is like if you make a change in here to go back and make it in your original too so usually the way I do it is I'll change my code and then paste that in. So I think the only thing I needed here is a language attribute. You can also just use your file directly. You can use your file directly if you want to, if you want to uh, input it. All right. There's also um, a validator for CSS. So I can go and I can bring my CSS code in here and it will tell me. Congratulations, no errors found. Yay, so that's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to do with all your web pages going forward. Um, let me go in just as an experiment. And let me change this to be a TD. Because I think if you say scope, no. Yeah, I think if you have the scope attribute, it needs to be a TH. I just want to verify that I didn't misspoke, misspeak. I think I can do HTML in this as well. Yeah. Well, okay, I stand corrected. I can't. So let's. Yeah, it's complaining that you shouldn't use a scope on a TD tag. Use a TH instead. So I was correct in saying that I had to change these to THs. That's what I wanted to verify. And I'll put lang equals English. And I should be good to go. There we go. So we have two clean files here. HTML and CSS has been validated. Again, take it for what it's worth. It's good to do it. It's like, it's good to be validated, but that's not enough to say it's a good web page. Now, let's go and validate out of curiosity some pages out on the web. I could validate by URI. Let's validate. Our website.
uh, only a couple of things wrong. Well, I don't know. I didn't make it to the end, so I shouldn't say that. Um, but just to get to this, uh, there's some warnings. Uh, you don't need to say type is JavaScript. That's something that you had to do in the old days. You don't really need to do it anymore. Uh, four not allowed on the span. Remember, what is the four used on? What tag have we seen the four on? Labels, right. So you don't put a four on a span, you put a four on a label. So in other words, this ought to be a label and not a span. This says the height of this image should be 31.875 pixels. How do you display half a pixel on a screen? So that's, a, that's an error. Duplicate IDs. Remember we had said before that an ID uh, has to be unique. And again, it's a big advantage of a class over that. ULs are not allowed as children of ULs. So you can nest ULs if you have nested lists, but a UL would have to be inside an LI. Border attribute is obsolete. They put a border on an image using HTML. Ooh, that's a penalty, right? Because you should be using CSS. And it even tells you, hey, use CSS if you want to do that. And so on down the line. You can't put a border on a, a tag and so on down the line. All in all, despite the fact that there are a lot of these, um, doesn't seem to be too horrible. All right. Let's check out Google. They have a handful of errors. Why do you think Google might have errors in it? This, this is a tough question. I don't expect you to necessarily know it. Possible. Well, that's, that's one thing. It works really fine. How many Google searches do you think are performed worldwide a day? Astronomical number, right? So the Google server is sending out a whole bunch of web pages, right? Well, if you're sending out that much data, a concern for you is going to be how much you're sending each time, how many bytes of data you're sending each time, right? Because if you're sending a whole bunch of giant files, then that's worse than if you're sending a whole bunch of medium-sized files. And if you're sending out a bunch of medium-sized files, if you can get it down to where you're sending a bunch of tiny little files, you're better off still. So I'm sure a consideration for Google is that let's keep the amount of data that we're sending low. All right? So therefore, um, if there are things that it can do um, that take up less characters to do, they're going to take the shortcut. It is interesting, though. And the only reason I do this, I don't do this to like, and maybe I shouldn't do it. Maybe I'm being a bad example in showing examples that didn't validate. Uh, I don't think so, though, because validation is really a great thing to do. But by the same token, no, it's not the be-all, end-all of everything. Uh, just because something validates doesn't mean that it's a good page or the opposite even. You know, there are compromises that, that are made. And in Google's case, for example, the compromise between space and all that. So it can still violate the rules, just like I could write in my instruction something that is grammatically incorrect, but it might be pretty clear what I mean anyhow. And 
you can figure it out, and in this case, the browsers can figure it out. All right, the remaining number of our classes will be spent mainly on JavaScript. And I'd like to introduce you to the concept of JavaScript with our last few minutes today. And then next time we'll get into the mechanics of actually how you do it. And in order to do this, I'm going to draw the drawing that I draw so many times every semester in like all of my classes. So if you have me for a bunch of classes, over time you're going to see this diagram a bunch of times. And the diagram looks like this. The client making a request through the internet that ends up at a web server. And the web server sending back a response to the client, which is a web page. And that web page contains HTML, CSS, and what we're going to start talking about today and next time, JavaScript. Now, we mentioned that there are some web pages that are static. And in the case of a static web page, the web page has already been written. <coughs> and it's out there waiting to be delivered. It's like the Big Mac if you go to McDonald's. It's sitting in the bin. It's waiting for someone to come in and ask for a Big Mac. The server just grabs it and hands it to you. All right? When we talked about forms, we talked about server-side scripting, which is like Subway, where they make every sandwich fresh for you right on the spot, on the fly. So Subway doesn't have a bin of every possible variation that are sub-sandwich. They have a recipe that they follow. And you asked for something, and they create it right there based on your input and your customizing and all that. Well, if you think of Google, or you think of Facebook, or you think of Canvas, everyone here, if you go to your Canvas page, is probably going to look different than everyone else's, because you're not enrolled in the same classes. You have a different name, and so on. So you supply information to the web server, namely who you are, and the web server creates your Canvas homepage fresh right there on the spot. And that is done via server-side scripting. And we talked about that a little bit when we talked about forms. These are dynamic pages, which means that they change without having to change the code. So for example, if you were to add a class, it's kind of late in the semester this year, but if you're talking about spring semester, if you were to add a class, all of a sudden it would show up on your Canvas page maybe the next time you logged on. And so that's a great thing about these, is we can write a computer program to query a database and create a web page on the fly for the users. But it still gets HTML, CSS, and JavaScript sent back to the users. Here's the idea of JavaScript. There's a computer at that end, but there's also a computer at this end, too or a mobile device, which is like a computer, right? It can process instructions, too. So the, there's things that we can do over here that we don't have to do over here. We're going to save the user a lot of time because they don't have to go through the internet to get a change to the page. JavaScript is primarily used to change an existing web page. Server-side scripting is used to create a page. So create a page, change a page. When I request a page that has JavaScript, I will get back the HTML, the CSS, and instructions on how to change that page. All right? So let's look at. a web page that has some JavaScript on it. All right. I requested this web page. I got back 
a bunch of HTML, some CSS, and some JavaScript. All right? Now, notice what happens if I go and I put my mouse over here. If I put my mouse over NFL, that NFL menu expands. If I put it over NBA, the NBA menu expands, and so on. Now, we're not going back to the server to get that menu. All right? Because we're not doing it, this happens instantaneously. All right? Notice that I can't see any lag. When I load this page initially the first time, we're on a fast uh, uh, connection, but notice that it takes a little while to load it. You can see the page appearing in pieces. That's because you're going to the server asking for this page, and it's sending it back. So as it's sending it back, you might see the page appear with a blank spot for the image, or you might see here and another here. Well, that's still on the way. Eventually, you get everything over. But notice this is different. If I put my mouse over these things, top events, these things, these things, that change happens instantaneously. There's no flicker. You don't notice anything in the status bar telling me that it's retrieving a page, like when you load the page. So down there it was saying some things, it's processing requests, blah, 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 blah. This happens instantaneously. And the reason for that is all this content came over the first time through. When I request a page, it contains not just the stuff that you see, but stuff that you don't see too. So all these menus are there from the start when you load this page. But they're just hidden. Then through JavaScript, we show and we hide the content. So we don't have to go and get the new content and redisplay the whole page. We can just have JavaScript that changes the existing page. OK, your mouse is on NBA. Make that part of the page visible. Your mouse is on Major League Baseball, make that part of the page visible, and so on down the line. Your mouse isn't over any of them, make all of them invisible. So there's instructions that allow for small changes to be made to the page without having to go back to the server. And that's a win-win, right? It's a win for you because you don't have to wait for the web server to get around to processing your request and sending you new information. And it's a win for the web server because all those little requests like that to change the way the page, it doesn't deal with it. Those requests never make it to the web server. They're handled through the JavaScript, through the instructions that get sent over when the page is initially loaded. So that's a concept. That's what we're going to do here. We're going to write code that's going to change an existing page without having to go back and reload the whole page. And we'll pick that up on Wednesday. All right, we'll see you up in lab.